Joining me now is Jim Irwin. Jim is president and CEO of Cool City Avionics. And Cool City develops a line of helicopter products. And Jim, thank you very much for taking some time to talk with us this afternoon. My pleasure. You've been around the business a while. Um, and I think people find your story compelling. Um, tell us a little bit about how you got involved in, in the avionics business. Well, I started in avionics in 1967 with Mitchell Industries in Mineral Wells, Texas. And Mitchell made uh, autopilots for small airplanes. And um, I was a pilot and I hired on to be a test pilot uh, and uh, evolved into managing a certification department and uh, just kind of stayed with that for quite a little while. I was there 12 years. I left and I uh, was one of the founders of Estec Corporation, also a manufacturer of autopilots for small airplanes. And um, uh, we sold that company in, in 2000 and I retired. And along the way, we had uh, started a helicopter system and I've been a helicopter uh, pilot since 1963 and always believed that uh, helicopter autopilots would be good sellers and a good safety addition in the industry, but they had to be priced right, and it seemed like most of them were too expensive. So uh, uh, we started one in, in the, uh, around 1996 at Estec, but we sold the company before the project was finished. But when uh, the company that purchased the, our company did not pursue it, continue to pursue it, I decided to come out of retirement and see if I could put some of the old team together and, and we'd finish the project. And so that's what we've been doing. So where does your project stand now? Well, I'm very pleased to say that we're probably within about uh, 30 days of getting the TSO and the STC on the first project airplane. You know, give or take a few days or a week, it's hard to forecast exactly, but uh, we're very, very close to the end. You've been waiting for certification for this product for a long time. What has been the, the stumbling block that has, that has kept it? When, when we talked with you last year, you felt like you were close to certification. Again, you feel like you're close to certification. What, what's, what has been the kind of the, the, the stumbling block in the road? <laughs> um, well, frankly, the, uh, there's, there's really t two elements uh, to, the, to the length of the project for us. One was the project is very complicated. It's a digital autopilot, four helicopters, but it was also designed for airplanes, same hardware. Uh, so, uh, and it was also designed to cross a number of weight boundaries. Uh, the first project aircraft we're doing, for instance, is a Robinson R44 that has a gross weight of about 2,500 pounds. But the second project, which we've already flown some on, is a 20,000 pound S61 Sikorsky. So the systems, uh, and the systems are fail passive, which is uh, a, a complication. And so there was a lot of technical, uh, basically complications in the development of the system as a family of products, not just one autopilot, but a family of autopilots that covered uh, several price ranges and, 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 and model aircraft model potentials and uh, so that uh, we probably underestimated some even though we had uh, an awful lot of experience and then the FAA uh, the FAA is a, 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 a long time organization that has a steady turnover of people as they retire and so on and we uh, went through several uh, retirements of uh, key FAA people and uh, and lost a little something there I think in capability on the FAA side and those things happen so we uh, we had a lot of uh, slowdowns associated with the certification effort itself 
and uh, however we've uh, we've largely won those battles and we're just about through with it now. What are some of the components of a helicopter autopilot that are different from a fixed wing autopilot? Well, the servos are a little bit different and some of them are quite different. Uh, helicopters are uh, basically statically unstable all the time. Airplanes, uh, on the other hand, are stable, have a high, high level of static stability. Uh, that means that uh, uh, you need to be able to move the controls on a helicopter very rapidly for very short distances uh, in order to make the, uh, the, the handling and the operation as precise as possible. It's always going to be trying to do something, and if you can stop it short at, with very small deviations, the, the, the result is a more accurate flight. Airplanes, uh, so that requires two different types of servo systems. One servos, the other one actuators uh, that are used in the stability augmentation portion of the system. Airplanes don't have a stability augmentation portion. They don't really need it. And uh, as far as the autopilot portion goes, there there's an awful lot of similar, more similarities than there are differences. Stop. So, what are some of the, the, the real challenges for making an autopilot work in a helicopter? Um, well, there's, there's, a, there's a number of them. Uh, first of all, the, uh, this thing I just mentioned of having to have a very uh, precise servo control that also needs to be able to move uh, quickly and in response to very small errors is important, much more important than I think it is in an airplane. Uh, there's also static system problems because, especially at low flight speeds, the airflow changes so much around a helicopter in different ways than it does on an airplane. And um, uh, the uh, I don't know, basically that's it. Most of the, the elements have to do with stability and how you treat it and how you, uh, how you work to improve it and so on. So what is the difference between the system that you're developing and, uh, well, first of all, I'll, I'll show my ignorance and say, is there any existing helicopter autopilot? If there, if that, there is such a thing, then what is it that, it's, that Cool City is doing that, that makes it a more innovative product? Well, yes, there are a number of helicopter autopilots, some of them quite old, uh, dating back to the 50s, the technology anyway, to the 50s and 60s and so on. There are modern ones, modern helicopter systems. Uh, I think uh, there's generally two trains of thought, I think, on how you fly a helicopter with an autopilot. One of them says you use the high rate uh, small displacement servos, a series of actuators for the stability augmentation element of the control equation, if you would. But you also use that same actuator to fly the autopilot modes, which are longer term. And then you retrim the position of the control system when the series actuator moves to its limit. Uh, a, a parallel actuator repositions the control system to allow the series actuator to again move. Basically, they, 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 uh, systems like that fly incrementally. If you're going to put the nose down five degrees, you may have to do it in two or three increments to get down there. Typically, it's done in a way that's perceived as being pretty smooth, but it actually is an incremental movement in terms of the attitude change. The other school of thought says that you use a autopilot servo rather than a trimmer and you actually drive the control system of the helicopter very much like you would a small airplane. And uh, in that case there's no incremental movement. The, uh, the servo can move the controls through their full range of control if necessary. Usually you only move a small amount at a time but there's no limitation on it built into the system itself. So that's a, a big difference on which technique you use. The advantage to a 
the technique for the uh, parallel servos, the servos that move the controls like the pilot does and can move through the full range. Uh, that system uh, uh, you know, has an advantage uh, basically in uh, how rapidly it can make larger attitude changes and that sort of thing. And also, there's an automatic level of redundancy regarding stabilization because the autopilot, since the autopilot servos uh, are different from the stabilization actuators, uh, the, uh, you've got a little bit of redundancy. If a servo fails, you can actually still use the, the series actuators as part of the stability system which the FAA mandates that you have. If it's IFR, you have to have, uh, you have to be able to stabilize the airplane even after a failure in the system. So uh, the redundancy element is almost automatic if you, if you use that technique where the autopilot servos do one function and the SAS servos do their function of stability augmentation. It's a little bit complicated, but... Uh, <laughs> so are helicopters. That's the best I can do, I think. <laughs> Well, Jim, when you look at certification standards, um, do you feel like that perhaps, and I know that Part 23 rewrite doesn't really carry over to helicopters quite so much as it does to other GA airplanes, but do you see this as maybe a trend and an easing of certification standards for things like the products you work on? Well, we hope so. We will, we, will, uh, we aim to do a Part 23, <coughs> excuse me, a Part 23 uh, airplane, and we have a version of this system it's for Part 23 and Part 25 airplanes also. And we are flying a Beach Baron right now, a Part 23 airplane. As far as certifications go, the modernization of Part 23 that gives uh, or makes an allowance for more, uh, more certification type judgments made by the applicant uh, as opposed to always using DERs in the FAA is a step in the right direction. Manufacturers have a tremendous amount of responsibility in the system, of course, and it's difficult uh, to have somebody who doesn't live with your project uh, telling you how to make it safer, if you would. We like to think in manufacturing that we design it safe to start off with, and if uh, a uh, small elements of that approval process should in fact be left to us. We're actually responsible for the whole thing all along. The FAA is responsible. And so a uh, shift that direction is, is welcome. One of the problems with FAA certifications, and it's I think been more of a problem in more recent years, is the inability within the FAA to, uh, at the operating engineer level, to make decisions. I don't fully comprehend why that is, but it seems like there's a lot of slowdown when it's time to approve something. Uh, things just slow down like they're in molasses. And uh, uh, in the early days, the FAA engineers seemed more capable of deciding that the regulations have been met and they can sign off on the requirement and they did so. Nowadays it's more done by committee and everything is a lot slower and frankly I don't think it's improved safety any, it's just slowed things down. Well Jim Irwin, we are out of time but thank you so much for taking some time to talk with us. Good luck and I hope that we're able to hear in about 30 days that you've gotten your certification and you're off and running. Well, thank you very much Tom. Thank you for joining us. Aero TV's coverage of the 57th Annual AEA International Convention and Trade Show, live from Nashville, Tennessee, is brought to you in part by the following sponsors. The Bendix King KLR-10 Lift Reserve Indicator is now available for certified aircraft. It is an affordable, intuitive device for angle of attack awareness. Mounted on the glare shield, KLR-10 provides visual and audible lift cues while scanning for traffic or monitoring the runway on approach. 
Finally, the extraordinary story of the world-changing XPRIZE space competition is being told and illustrated with hundreds of insider photos in Jim Campbell's colorful new book, Beyond the Blue. Journey with Jim as he flies formation with spaceships, plays in zero gravity, prepares rocket racers, and documents the amazing first decade of the personal space race. Available this summer. Get your advance order in now by checking out www.kindredspirit.com.